This is part one of an overview of John Stuart Mill and his theory of utilitarianism, the most basic principles for ethics, according to Mill. So first, a little bit of background about Mill. He was born in 1806. He died in 1873. He is probably the most prominent, most influential British philosopher of the 19th century and maybe even of all the English-speaking world. He covered areas in political philosophy especially as well as ethics, but he also did philosophy of science and a very well-rounded philosopher. And he is the most famous proponent of utilitarianism. Now, in some way or another, utilitarianism has been around since the earliest days of philosophy. Prior to Mill in Britain, a famous uh, philosopher, Jeremy Bentham, was a strong proponent of utilitarianism. And John Stuart Mill took up that history, that task. And he was trained to be a philosopher. Some, some people are trained to be athletes, like Tiger Woods, who had a golf club in his hand when he was three years old, or uh, a tennis player you probably have never heard about, Andre Agassi, who's won several uh, majors in the uh, 80s and 90s, and uh, he was trained to be a tennis player. Well, John Stuart Mill was trained to be a philosopher. He learned Greek uh, before the age of most kindergartners. He was doing Latin by seven. So when he was 10, 11, 12, he was hanging out with other people, talking about Plato and looking at Aristotle in the original Greek. So he was really trained to do a philosopher and obviously very brilliant in order to be able to do those things. Now, what he did, what we're going to focus on is to the fact that Mill sought to identify the most fundamental moral principle, what we can use to determine right or wrong, good or bad in everything we do. So first, utilitarianism in a nutshell. One way you could say this is to produce the best consequences. The theory is a form of consequentialism. We focus on the results of an action. Those are much more important than any rules or motives or character. So the results are what we're looking at. And we want the best results, of course. More precisely, we might put it this way, promote the greatest good for the greatest number. So this could be applied both in ethics and in political theory. The idea is you're not just looking out for the consequences that benefit you, you are looking out, you are looking to produce the consequences that benefit the most people. And for Mill, how did he define this? He said an act is right to the extent that it tends to promote the good. So that's how you can tell if what you're doing is right or wrong. Does it promote the good? And it's wrong to the extent that it tends to reduce the good. Okay, that's speaking in generality still. So let's try to sort this out more carefully. What is the good would be a natural question to ask at this stage. Well, for Mill, he says the good for humans is happiness. And his argument is very simple. He says, look, everyone wants to be happy. Now, you may have heard of somebody being described as, as wanting to be miserable, or he seems to love to be unhappy. But when you take those seriously, they're kind of paradoxical claims. It's saying that they're, what brings them the most happiness is to be miserable. So everybody wants to be happy, argues Mill. So happiness is the good for humans. So promoting happiness then is going to be the greatest good. So what is happiness? The next natural question to ask here, what's happiness? And Mill says happiness is pleasure and the absence of pain. This is extremely important. It's it's something for utilitarianism. Other moral theorists define happiness in different ways. So it's crucial to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about happiness. For Mill, he makes it very clear. We're talking about pleasure and the absence of pain, the avoidance of pain. 
And so pleasure can be measured in a few different ways. I've put three of them up here, and there are other means of measuring pleasure that are significant, but in this brief overview, I'm going to focus on these three that are very important in how you measure uh, pleasure. And Mill certainly wants to measure things. He's an empiricist. He, he would love the technology that we have available in the 21st century to look at people's brains when they're experiencing pleasure. You could actually do lab work on this to, act, to determine what's the most moral action you can do. So uh, I think Mill would, would be interested in that. Okay, so how do we measure pleasure and pain? First of all, by its duration. How long does the experience last? Obviously, if it's pleasure, the longer the better. If it's pain, the longer the worse. By its intensity, how intense is the experience? Often if you go to the doctor, a physician, and you're seeking medical attention for something that's hurting you, you may be asked to rate your pain on a scale of one to 10. And so one being something that's uh, mildly uncomfortable, hardly noticeable, and 10 being the most intense, uh, horrible pain you have ever experienced. And then you, you could just put it on that scale, right? And you could do the same with pleasure. So, you know, one uh, mildly, you know, feeling comfortable and 10 experiencing the most intense pleasure ever. And so that's a second way you can measure pleasure and pain. And then finally, by its extent, and this is obviously crucial, it's built into the definition of utilitarianism, how many people are affected? That's the extent. And so that's a simple count. So we can measure all of these, right? You can measure the first, just how we measure time. The second, we just put it on a scale of one to 10. The third, you just count the number of people affected. So there's an initial objection that goes back to Aristotle, actually. Uh, of course, I said utilitarianism has been around since the ancient Greeks. And the objection is this is a pig's philosophy. The idea is it lowers us to the level of a pig or a beast, right? Animals seek pleasure and avoid pain, but we don't consider them to be doing morally good things or morally bad things. So this is odd. It seems to put us on the same level of animals. Now, Mill had a basic response to this. this is, there are other factors that he uses to respond, but one of the responses is to say that happiness varies in quality. So we could say this is a fourth aspect of pleasure and pain that we can use to measure to decide what is good and what is bad. So what is quality? Quality is measured by preferences. We don't really have our question answered yet, but let's work through this. The idea is that if you offer two people the same activity and they, they are both able to enjoy both things, uh, well, you could do this with one person, you could do this with a million people, right? Take a survey, which do they prefer to do, right? So. Imagine there is an hour uh, that somebody needs to pass the time for an hour. So you offer them, uh, the two people, all right, you can play chess or you can play tic-tac-toe for the next hour. Which would you prefer to do? And we imagine they both know how to play chess and have some uh, background in that. And clearly playing tic-tac-toe with the same person for an hour is going to get boring. It's going to get old. Either you have one person that's very foolish and loses all the time, or they're both uh, smart enough that it's going to be a draw all the time. So uh, tic-tac-toe, not very preferable there. Or uh, we, when I was first at Western, just a little story here, I was preparing for uh, teaching ancient philosophy. I was very excited about it. I had studied a lot of ancient philosophy uh, in graduate school at Notre Dame, and I uh, thought this is really cool that I'm able to teach Aristotle and study philosophy. So I was figuring out what I wanted to include in the class. I uh, can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. And I was enjoying going through Aristotle, reviewing it, studying it, rereading parts, trying to figure out what he's uh, saying to make sure that I had it right. And uh, I was interrupted when I, when I was doing this one morning. 
uh, by some giggling in the hallway. And uh, it wasn't time for the students to be there yet, but I knew there was some faculty around. I tried to ignore it, focus on my Aristotle, but the giggling continued. And so I went out in the hallway and I found that there was a group of, of sociologists and they were, they just got a bunch of books uh, delivered and they were wrapped in bubble wrap. And so they were sharing the bubble wrap and popping the bubble wrap and enjoying it. Now there's something oddly pleasurable about popping bubble wrap. It's kind of a mystery to me, but we like to do it. Everyone likes to do it, it seems. But the idea is which would you rather do for an hour? If you are capable of studying philosophy, you have a background in it, uh, and you're offered just take an hour to pop bubble wrap or study philosophy, most people are going to study philosophy. Yes, okay, maybe I'm off on that, but it seems to be a lot more interest, interesting than popping bubbles. So what's the difference here? What, what is the bottom line? How do you measure quality? Well, the idea is that quality is measured by the level of intellectual involvement in the process. The more your intellect is involved, the higher the quality of the pleasure or pain for that matter, right? So it would be better for you to uh, have a friend, you know, accidentally step on your toe and experience a broken toe, which is a lot of pain, than have the same friend betray you and, and speak badly about you to others. That would hurt more because of its intellectual involvement. So the, this applies to both pleasure and pain, and now we have four ways to measure these things. All right, let's do a test case. Imagine you have an inheritance worth a million dollars, a great aunt, you didn't even know her, that you didn't know you had one, and uh, so you're not grieved by this, but you inherit a million dollars, and there's a restriction on it, though. The restriction is you, can, you have to use it. You can't save it, you can't invest it, you have to use it in one of these two ways. Either you use the money to study in Europe with a few others uh, for a few years, or you use the money to throw one massive blowout party. You invite your friends from high school, you invite your Facebook friends, you invite all the people you know because you are going to be famous for this party. This is gonna be so great, a million dollar party. Imagine the food, drink, and entertainment you could buy with that. And uh, the other restriction here is for your inheritance. In order to get the million dollars, you have to sort this out, figure out what Mill would recommend that you do. What is the morally good thing to do? Now, on face value, it certainly seems like promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Clearly, that's the party and the intensity of the pleasure with the party. That sounds like that would be the direction to go. So you're faced with this, though, which produces the most happiness. You have to reflect on this more carefully and think it through. Well, here's a suggested calculation. Many people would do this slightly differently, but my suggestion is that you multiply the number of people involved, that's the extent, times the intensity on a scale of one to 10, times the time involved. Let's say the party is going to involve 100 people. They're going to experience the greatest pleasure possible, and it's going to last a couple days or nights and nights, at, and then you have to include the level of quality. Let's say it's a four, there's good conversation, and uh, you know, but it's not real high quality here. It's a party after all, but there's good conversation. But then again, uh, with time, a few people will get a little bit too intoxicated. Uh, there are some quality points dropped because some people have hangovers and uh, there might even be some missed work as a result of this and so on. But anyway, let's multiply all that out. You have 500 times 10 times two times two and you have 20,000. And that's, we'll just call these utilitarian units. So that's how much you would have on the party side. Your other option, studying in Europe. Well, how many people? Uh, one or two friends seems reasonable, but then again, if you took two uh, with a long period of time, it's gonna end up being two against one. So let's make it four, that'll be more even. And uh, so you have four people, you have a million dollars. How long can you study? Well, 
if you're dividing the million dollars among four people, that's $250,000. You can stay in Europe at least a couple of years with that. It'll cover your flight. It'll cover your, your time there, your lodging, your, your food, and your tuition to very nice schools. You're going to go to Oxford and Cambridge and Paris and Rome and Munich, and you're going to go to the greatest schools across Europe and spend a semester at each and summer sessions and so on. Of course, you're experiencing a lot of the culture too. And so uh, let's just call it a three intensity level. I'm, I would say it's probably going to be more, but let's be conservative on that. And uh, as I suggested, the t money would allow you at least 700 days of studying. You don't count the days spending at the beach in Spain. Uh, and then uh, let's say uh, 10 quality points. I mean, this is a high level of an intellectual involvement while you're there. And so you do the multiplication on that and you get 84,000 utilitarian units, four times what you get with the party. Now, I know you can, you can maneuver these a little bit around, but it seems like for Mill, it's pretty clear he's going to recommend the studying that's going to produce the most pleasure when you think through pleasure and pain in the ways that he suggested. So there we have a broad introduction to utilitarianism and then how to apply it in certain situations with these calculations. And Mill has addressed one of the biggest criticisms. In part two, we're gonna con consider some more criticisms that might be raised against utilitarianism.